My name is Dipali Rathod and this is PathToPassionTV.com. Today we will be speaking to the lovely Joya Das. Just to give you a background on this woman, she's spent 15 plus years in the media industry working, working for all the major networks ranging from CBS, ABC, CNN, now New York One, now and New York CNN, One, yeah. right, and also ABS, which is the Asian variety show where she talks about all the fun stuff, Bollywood yeah. and entertainment, and she's also done very serious reporting and business anchor, and um, she has her own media company called Avenue Media, which she's founded with a friend, where she's focused on cause media, mm -hmm. where she hopes to highlight philanthropic efforts or social justice-based media. Right. Uh, Joy is actually doing a photo shoot today on culture and heritage. That's why she's dressed in this wonderful sari and the ethnic jewelry. Um, Joya has been an amazing inspiration to me and many other women. And I hope with this interview that it inspires you to follow your dreams and to take action on your path to passion. Thank you for having me. Thanks for joining Thank us, Thank you Joya. for choosing me. Thank you for joining us, Joya. Um, let's start by talking a little bit about your background. Please sure. tell the viewers, you know, your background, where you're from, um, you know, just a little bit more about your background. And it's a relevant conversation to have, right? Because I'm decked out in this gear, which I normally don't walk out on the New York streets in, <laughs> looking right. like I'm about to get hitched. But I am, I'm Bengali by heritage, but I am American born. So my parents emigrated here in 1969 when the immigration laws changed. My mother from Calcutta, my dad from Burma. I would love to be able to say that they have been here for 40 years and they have embraced America. They sort of embrace it a la carte, um, which I think makes it hard for the kid that's straddling both generations, being both American and Indian. Right. So, and, you, I mean, you are the first generation mm -hmm. of, you know, your family in this country. So it's very difficult to balance both cultures and fit in and at the same time grow and develop into who you want to be. Yeah, I mean, as a teenager, you spend a lot of time, part of your currency or your star quotient when you're in school is to conform as much as you can. And so some of that really meant for me pushing away being Indian, not wearing the clothes, not eating the food, although I loved doing all of that and always did when I was at home. But I think the way I felt the most different from kids when I was growing up is that my parents were afraid of everything. So if it was a birthday party of a kid that they didn't know, or if it was you know, cheerleading or choir, or anything that they weren't familiar with, I was absolutely unequivocally not allowed to do it. And so no was something you heard quite often in your family growing yeah, up. Yeah, no's were leveled at me regularly. A, because I was a very sort of outward spoken, strong willed kid, so I heard it a lot. And I also wanted to do things. I was curious. I, I was curious about the world around me and I wanted to be a part of it. I wanted the fabric of, of, of what was going on with my friends around me to be part of my life. So it was really frustrating growing up with my parents. And when people asked me, how was it different being Indian? For me, it was that they were so paralyzed by their fear that it really kept me from being able to do a lot of the things that let me fit in. Wow. I mean, but look at you now. You've become, you've grown into your own and you've made it in this, you know, cutthroat media industry and being one of the few successful South Asian journalists, mm -hmm. being a woman, it's a true inspiration to me and I aspire to be someone like you one day. You want to be so, a journalist yeah, as well. Yeah, I do. And, you know, I feel like everyone has a voice and everyone has a story that needs to be shared. Yeah. And we need, we need the variety and we need different viewpoints. So well, it's, I mean, a amazing. lot of people, uh, you know, what's interesting in the last while since I've been at this for a while, a lot of teenage girls or girls in college say, oh, you know, I did exactly what my parents asked me to do. I went into finance or I went to become a doctor. And I realize now four years in, three years in that I absolutely hate my life. Oh, my God. How <laughs> is it? Been there. Done yeah. That. <laughs> and you've told me your story. So, right. you know exactly what I'm talking about. And, you know, parents, Indian parents specifically, really push their kids into the doctor, lawyer, engineer, investment banker professions because they're immigrants and they see security in that. They see a, a constant payroll from that. And I get that. Um, but where my story is different is that I don't think I necessarily came from a typically Indian family. Um, I come from a home of domestic violence. And so that was something that really galvanized me and solidified my position that I wanted to get out of my house as soon as I could. Wow. And college was my ticket out. Wow. Um, I also knew since, the day, since I was 11 that I wanted to be a, a TV anchor. And by the time you know, I was 18, I was like, you know, really itching to get out of the house because of the dynamics that were there. And so my parents and I had a conversation about what I was going to do in college. And my dad said, well, of course, and naturally, you're going to become a doctor. <laughs> and I course. was like, no, I'm not. 
And through a series of events, it came to be that I was going to have to finance college by myself, and I had to finance grad school by myself because I was, as a girl, challenging what the popular opinion was in the house. But I guess where like maybe my brother or some other people would be crestfallen at the prospect of having to be out there strung out on their own, I was like, hallelujah, bring it. Wow. Because I just wanted to cut ties as quickly and as, as, as unequivocally as I could. So my, I, I remember saying to my parents, if that's your decision, then you don't have the right to ever tell me what to do ever again. And so my path went from there where I went to college. I didn't know anybody in the industry, so then I went to grad school because to me that was the quickest and easiest way to build a base of contacts because I didn't know anybody. So you, you went to undergrad and mm -hmm. did you major in, you majored in English and, psych, and, uh, in English and psychology. psychology. So yeah. was that geared towards know, knowing that you wanted to be a journalist that this would help you in that path or was that? I think the first couple years of college I was still just try trying to find my footing. I was trying to pay for something that was $19,000 a year. I always knew in the back of my mind that I wanted to be a journalist but there were some other pressing concerns that took precedence before any of that solidified. So I'd say by like junior year, I was well on my path to carving my way to grad school and figuring out the journalism part of it, but I think I really floundered for the first couple of years just trying to figure out myself and trying to figure out how to get my sea legs beneath me because it was the first time I was out on my own. So like laundry, how much detergent do you put in like the washer, like things like that were like the, that are banal but are important to your everyday right, life right. consumed a lot of my everyday. So like by junior year I was definitely like back on path, back on track to carving where it is that I wanted to go. I think it's really important to know, uh, for people to know how resilient you are. I mean you're such a strong willed woman and I mean, the first glimpse of this we got in your you know, first obstacle you faced, getting into college, and then you have to fund it on your own. Mm -hmm. So how did you come up with the funding to you know, be able to pay for your schooling every year? Yeah, well, I mean, I remember going to the registrar's office, and it was second semester, sophomore year, and I'd gone to register for my classes, and the person just sort of blithely announced to me that nobody had paid for last semester, and nobody had paid the bill that was due for this semester, get out. And again, like my big impetus at 18 was to get out of my house. So the last thing I wanted was to have to go back. And fin I'd be damned if finances were going to be the factor that was going to keep me from being able to do that. Um, so I started a letter writing campaign. I wrote a lot of letters. Um, and to make a long story short, eventually there was an alumnus, a doctor actually, somewhere out in the Midwest who had established a fund for aspiring journalists. It was a Bucknell scholarship. Bucknell is where I'd gone to school. And I got a letter in the mail one day. It was actually during sorority rush. And I remember taking the, looking at the letter and thinking it was another bill saying I owed money. I just threw it on the desk and forgot about it. Huh. And after rush was over, I picked it up and I looked at it. And I was like, you know, the language on this seems to be different, but I can't really understand it. So by this point, a, a lot of my life was spent in the CFO's office of the college because he was forever trying to shake me down for money, which I didn't have. But I was like, I'm going to figure this out. You and me, we are going to sit here and we are going to figure this out. And, you know, I'm sure he was like, whatever, girl, you know, you're like 19. I don't know where you're going to come up with this. But I remember walking into his office with that letter, and it was the first time I saw him smile. And he was like, you, young lady, are very lucky. You just got a scholarship to finance half of your education. Wow. He's like, how are you going to fund the rest? And it was funded through a series of uh, state grants, federal grants, and then I just struck a deal with the devil at that table and said, you know, whatever the remaining amount is, I will start to pay the minute I graduate. You're not dealing with my parents anymore, you're dealing just with me. A lot of South Asian women will ask me, how is it that you have the moxie or the chutzpah to do what you did? Right. And, and the one important piece I want to point out that's different in my household versus, I hope, most others, is that there was the piece of domestic violence, you which was a huge... unusual circumstance. I mean, dealing with domestic violence is not something that most girls have to deal with. Right. It really shaped you and, and in terms of developing that strength and that backbone. Yeah, I mean, it was the impetus behind my wanting to really break from my household. So that's an important piece to point out of why I was so strong-willed in the opposite direction. But most South Asian young women that I talk to come from very loving homes where their families were supported both financially and emotionally and understanding otherwise. And so really the guilt factor comes in and saying, well, they've supported me and been there for me in so many ways. How do I now stand up and say, I'm going to go do something different? Right. And, and here's, here's what I would say in answer to that question. It's that at the end of the day, you have to look yourself in the mirror and be happy with who you are. Right. And be whole and be 
first and foremost, loving who you are. Exactly. And if you don't do that, if that piece is not complete and you don't like what you see in the mirror, you're in, unhappy inside, that will bleed into every part of your life with your parents, with your friends, with your prospective partner or your current partner. And, and that's so important to realize, and I don't think some people have that foresight when they're first getting out into the workforce or first, you know, in right, college. Right. You know, sometimes you get to a point in your career where, well, as we were saying earlier, you absolutely hate what you're doing. You absolutely hate your life. And they're like, but I don't know what I want to do next. Right. And I've taken a series of women's empowerment classes in the last couple of years. And a lot of that, the fabric of that class was taking as the teacher would put it, sweeping your own side of the street, being accountable for how you are totally responsible for where you are in your life. And it really gave me like a blueprint, if you will, for you know how to kind of carry myself gracefully through my life now and understand how important it is to take care of yourself first because it affects how you show up for everybody else in your life. Completely agree. Can you just tell us how you do it all? How do you stay balanced? <laughs> how do you stay grounded? And then the second key point, I think what women need to understand is time management and organization skills. Like Absolutely. How, you know, how, what are your key takeaways on that? I think it's so, so, so important to take care of yourself first. So the value of saying no, I think as women we're, we're sort of uh, conditioned to always say yes. And I think it's important to start learning the value of saying no, which is something I've only really embraced in the last couple of years. I'm sorry, no, I can't do this. Because you need to make sure, and my point earlier about making sure that you take care of yourself first because it's going to affect the way you show up for all the other commitments in your life. That being said, and I'm sure it's very frustrating for people who have tried to date me or friends, but I book two weeks out. I, it's, it's impossible for me to be spontaneous in some regard uh, a lot of the time. I really make sure that if someone asks me for something, I'm saying, you know, I absolutely want to honor the commitment. I absolutely want to see you, but I need you to give me some notice. And I need you, you know, and so generally speaking, my calendar and I are best friends. And I, and I make sure that I show up. If I say I'm going to be at something, I always show up. Um, I think that's important to say to your word at the end of the day to somebody who you've never met before, don't have a relationship with, is probably the most important thing you can give them. It sets a precedence for so much else. So, I, you know, if I if I commit to something, I definitely always show up. But I oftentimes am double booked <laughs> on evenings. But you know, I make sure that it's no more than two commitments in an evening. That I make sure I support one person at one thing and support someone else else at another a lot of freelance work so you're mm -hmm. obviously managing your own time um, what are some of the challenges you faced working as a freelance uh, journalist so my life is broken up into three major parts I have my business news avatar which I do weekdays I've got a Saturday morning show that I've hosted for the better part of a decade that's on Saturday mornings and then I have my own production company so I have clients that myself and my producing partner service and I think being freelance means that there are days that I am working three jobs, two jobs, and then there are days that I'm working just one job. But it's just being 110% on certain days and maybe 50% on other days and seriously budgeting in breaks. Like I just took a two-week break, a forced, imposed break, detaching from my life to have some of that perspective. Right. You were it's just important. in south of France and had a wonderful vacation. Yeah, and um, it could be anywhere. It could be a yoga class for right, an hour and a half. Right. It's just so important just, to have that hit that reset button. Right, totally agree. Even if you're going 150 miles an hour, which I do on most days, to make sure that you're checking in with yourself and like, am I where I'm at? Is this where I want to be? And so, I think yoga is a huge conduit for that. Okay. And you're also involved in a lot of women's initiatives and, and charity organizations. Can you tell us a little bit about what your motivation is and what inspired you to get involved in all these different things? So as a teenager, you know, I spent so much time distancing myself from everything Indian because everything Indian for me connoted bad. And it wasn't until I was 30 and I'd had enough now distance from my home life and, and had some time to re really rebalance that I started to reconnect with being Indian. Um, I was doing the morning market reports on CNN every morning and my grandmother would be watching in Calcutta. So it was 5 p.m. her time. Um, 5 a.m. New York time. There's Aww. a 12 hour difference. And we started up a dialogue, you know, over the phone of like, oh, I'm going to be on in the next five minutes, turn on your TV. And eventually everybody in the neighborhood had their TV wow. on in Calcutta and <laughs> Taligunj, where my grandmother lives, because she was so proud to be able to say her, gran her granddaughter was on TV. And it was eventually that I was like, gosh, you know, I've been having these phone conversations with her. Why don't I just go 
and meet her in person. So had you never met her prior to this? I mean, I had gone when I was a baby, but I don't have any real reference for her. Right. Um, so I bought a ticket. I was 30 years old and went by myself and met in my entire extended family for the first time. Wow. And so truth be known, I think that's where my first sort of love affair began with India. And it was when I started to host AVS. It's when I started to speak on behalf of more charities, MC more galas. It just became important to re-embrace my heritage, but to do it on my own terms as opposed to the terms that somebody else was forcing down my throat. Wow, that's really powerful. And so your grandmother is really a strong character and a source of inspiration for you. Yes, I'm wearing all white today to channel her style. She was always a very <laughs> elegant, classically beautiful Bengali woman. And her style was to always wear a white sari with some kind of accent color. I love it. You know, you knew at the age of 11 that you wanted to be a journalist. Mm -hmm. You'd be sitting at home watching TV and the only thing your father would allow you to watch would be news, right? Of course. That and Sesame Street. Right. Electric so, company. So yeah, you watch the news and you, you know, you watch Dan rather and you got so inspired with all this important news that he was talking about. Mm -hmm. How did you, from that age onwards to where you are now, I mean, you've become so successful. How did you, you know, channel that energy or I don't know how did you follow that passion how did you make it a reality what, what were some of the action steps you took well I would have to credit my mom through my formative years in my college not college so much but maybe like high school and middle school where she entered me into writing competitions or essay competitions so the love of language the love of words the love of writing is something that was part of my everyday because she was I mean at the time of course I was complaining I was like ah, I want to go play you know but I, I look back now and I realize that that's really kind of the formative years when I learned to love Love writing and so I decided early on that I couldn't live a life without writing as a component of it it's like oxygen for me it's such an important part um, and then taking it one step further and not only taking my writing but being able to deliver it is a real privilege right. um, how did I achieve you know zero to 60 I mean it was just every day chipping away chipping away here's my goal and I'm gonna take the next job and the next job and the next job that's gonna get me there um, what were some of the challenges you faced? I mean, I'm sure it wasn't easy being, a, you know, an Indian woman trying out for jobs at all these major networks. I don't know if being Indian necessarily was an obstacle. I think that it was just doing this completely and totally by myself without any real support other than from very good friends is what was the bigger challenge. Right. Um, I, Wait, so you did everything, it, it was almost like a grassroots effort. You were your own supporter, you had your friends backing you, but you didn't have that solid family support that most people have. Yeah, like I moved to Casper, Wyoming for my first on-air job. It was population 50,000. You know, it was a very a very homogeneous, very white American town that I moved to. I think I brought the entire minority population of the town up to two <laughs> when I moved there for the six months that I did. But, you know, moving out there was a big, big ballsy maneuver because I wanted so badly to be able to make this career happen. And at, at that time, it's changed a lot. Uh, journalism has changed a lot. But at that time, uh, you move to a small market to go and make your mistakes. But ultimately, you walk out of there with a tape. So the next person that hires you can look at you and say, OK, she cuts the muster, or she's the look I'm going for, or this is, this is who I want to be part of my morning news team, or however it shakes out. But going out there, you know, I was making $15,000 a year and trying, you know, trying to get by when I was still carrying all of these loans that I had incurred from college and grad school. So that was not an easy hoe. You know, that was not an easy slog in that period of time. And I think that was challenging. Right. Um, then, but I'm very determined. I'm very focused when I want to be. And I was determined that I was going to be out there for as limited a time as possible, get a decent tape together, and come right back to New York, which is what I did inside of six months. Wow. I then uh, started working on the stock exchange floor. So in earnest, my business news career started. What inspired started. you to get into the business reporting side of things? Was that something that you'd always envisioned yourself doing, or do you have a passion for one particular thing? My first job out of the gate was a producer at CNBC. CNBC, MSNBC, when it was still in its inception, uh, and MSNBC.com and CNBC.com, I'm sorry, while they were in their inception. So that was my first sort of feet to the fire in terms of business news. And of course, when I was in Casper, Wyoming, and when I was first starting out as a producer at CBS, it was more general assignment. And I think in that time period, I was able to really figure out that business news, because of the science, the math, the technology that goes into explaining it, was far more alluring to me. If there's a rape, if there's a murder, if there's some like major disaster happening, I am not that girl. I'm not that. that you got to have a fire in your belly that wants you, that gets you out of bed every morning, whether it's 2:30 or 3:30 in the morning, which is something I did for a very long time, to want to get you to work. And I didn't have the fire in the belly to cover that stuff, but I did have it for business news, and I still have it today. 
So Bloomberg was uh, where I was brought in as a reporter producer. I was an understudy to the uh, current reporter that was doing business news because there's a language that comes with delivering business news, and so I had to learn it. And then every day at the end of the day, I had to get up in front of the camera and deliver a report. And I did that for seven months until finally my boss deemed me worthy. She's like, okay, you're ready. You're ready to do this. And so after that, I went to CNN. I would say CNN really put me on the map. After that, I was uh, the morning business reporter for ABC for four years. And then after that, I've gone back to CNN, and now I'm currently with New York One, where I'm uh, working freelance, still doing business news, but more on my own terms. I'm not so owned completely by the network. Um, can you tell us about finding mentors and finding supporters to help you along the way? I feel that we as women don't necessarily reach out and ask for that support, whereas men, I mean, me being in the corporate world, I was there for almost four years and, you know, spent two years as an analyst at Deutsche Bank, and I felt the men were all about supporting each other, finding mentors, and, you know, I failed to find one for myself. Mm -hmm. And it was really a struggle for me, and, you know, how did you, did you have supporters or mentors in this industry when you started out? And how did you go about doing that? I think I've had some people that um, championed my cause, if you will. And they don't necessarily have to be people who are up here. They can be people who are sitting right next to you. I would say one of the guys that I absolutely and totally credit my career with was the guy who ran Master Control for me at Bloomberg. And the person that I had to sit in front of and do that that report at the end of the day after I was so tired I'd been there for 12 hours and I had to get up there and fumble around and try to like you know deliver a report until every day until I was ready right. and I remember there came to a point where I was like I don't want to do this anymore I'm never going to become a reporter this is not ever going to happen for me and he was like you got to get up there and you got to do this today Joy you got to do this you. today he believed yeah, in me he, he saw something push. in me yeah. so sometimes a mentor doesn't necessarily have to be somebody who's you know inaccessible it can be someone who just believes in you right and that can come in so many forms. And, and, and uh, every couple months I write him, he, he's since moved back to Trinidad, and I say, you know, I have you to thank for a lot of what I am today because you just pushed me at that time when I was at a crossroads and I was like, this isn't gonna happen for me. Wow, it's really powerful. Um, what advice would you give to young women or other people who are interested in career transitions, who may have done other things and, or, you know, weren't sure if that's what they wanted to do and are now beginning to realize who their authentic self is and what they really want to do and, and what they want to follow in life. So I think that it's important to look for a job while you have a job. So in other words, say you're working in, okay, I understand that banking is very, very demanding and you probably don't have a lot of hours for yourself, but if you can carve out maybe two hours a week a weekend that you can go and shadow somebody in a career that you want to be in. Maybe you want to start a coffee shop and you go and you have a weekly conversation with somebody who owns a coffee shop because that's something that you aspire to do. Make that promise to yourself once a week that you're going to spend that hour, two hours, dedicated to figuring out a way to transition into that next career. Maybe you take on an apprenticeship. Maybe you shadow somebody for a day at their job. Um, whatever it is that you can do in short increments so it's so not interrupted to your current life and figure out that it's not so scary. Figure out a way to like maybe maybe your first job isn't going to be the most ideal one but you know that you're working your way to whatever the ideal position is. I think a lot of people get stymied by the fact they're like yeah but that's not really the job that I was looking for. That doesn't mean you won't get there. Right. You'll get there, but maybe this is the first step towards getting there. Maybe right. this apprenticeship, maybe this internship, maybe this one day a week of shadowing. You never know who you're going to meet because you're automatically putting yourself in the line of fire. You're putting yourself in the, in the way of harm, essentially, right? To be able to meet somebody who might champion right. your cause or meet somebody who's going to yeah. say, I want to hire you. You're doing some wonderful work with the documentary that you produced mm -hmm. called First Sight. Mm -hmm. Can you tell, tell everyone a little bit more about that? Yeah, I mean, I think this all was a gen, uh, it's German, it was a germ that started when I was 30 and I made that first trip to India, that I, f I went there and I felt like I want to do something bigger. I have this skill set. I have given up so much in the way of family relationships. I've sacrificed so much to get here. I feel like I need to do something bigger with this skill set that I have, with this career that I've achieved so far. So I would say a good, between 30 and 38, that idea kind of, germinated and sat and sat on the back burner and it didn't really solidify for me until my last trip to Calcutta which was in March of 2009 when it occurred to me that I could use my skill set 
ally with a humanitarian cause and create a film, a humanitarian style film. So First Sight was really born out of a desire to do that. It was also born out of a desire to spend more than the gratuitous 10 days of vacation time in India. I wanted to spend more time there and be immersed in a culture for a while. Um, it was a tough slog getting that film out the door. I'd never done something of that nature before. But you were essentially an entrepreneur, right? So I was, I was. You did everything from the ground up, from fundraising to putting the team together. To it was a real grassroots right. effort. Everything was independent. All of the money came from friends and family and doing fundraiser after fundraiser. And now the film is done, and I'm in the process of continuing at the grassroots movement where I'm asking people to host screenings, asking people to sponsor screenings. Something that really struck me from reading about the first site documentary production was that you don't take no for an answer. Like, go for what it is you really want. Like, for every 13 doors that you knock, like, 12 will be resounding no's, and one will be that emphatic yes. And when you get that yes, right. it makes all those no's just completely evaporate. Right. And when you get that yes, it's from somebody who, again, believes in you, believes in what you're doing, is like-minded, and you never know where that relationship is going to take you. Right. Um, I don't take no for an answer at all, and I'm terrible at it. And I'm sure <laughs> a lot of boyfriends and friends would tell you that it's a very frustrating thing about me, but I just don't take no for an answer. I always think that there's a way to figure out. Um, when I was at CNN, I really wanted to anchor, and I was too young at the time, looking back, and you know, no one, no one said yes. So that's when I went and knocked on the door at ABS. I knocked on the door there and I said, hey, I've been watching your show. I really want to do this. If you ever need someone to fill in, I would like to be that person. Right. And I remember the producer asked me, he's like, why do you want to do this? And I explained my story and that I was re-embracing being Indian for the first time. But more than anything, I wanted to anchor. And uh, if I couldn't, couldn't, in my current employment situation, figure out a way to anchor, then I was going to go figure out another route. And I think embracing being Indian, maybe going and championing an Indian Indian show was probably going to be the way that yeah, I was going to achieve it. And perfect. that's that's how it happened. Yeah, I mean, you have managed to make pathways and make connections and really follow your dreams. Mm -hmm. And I hope that our viewers are encouraged and inspired by your story, because I certainly am. And I want to thank you so much for taking the time to speak to us. Sure. So everyone, mm -hmm. love who you are and do what you love. Thank you. You're welcome.